Olá! O Fronteiras do Pensamento apresenta a segunda parte da conferência Os Desafios da Democracia com Gary Kasparov. No programa de hoje, o enxadrista e ativista político alerta para uma crise tecnológica associada à crise do desenvolvimento capitalista e associa a relação disso com a política e a democracia na Rússia e em diversos países do mundo. Acompanhe! The 21st century is a, a communication reformation. The internet, which could be compared to printing press with its ability to reach more people. It changes dramatically the balance of forces in, in, in the society because it involves more and more people in the decision-making process. And uh, I've no doubt that with an, um, Uh, open debate, Putin's regime would not survive even a month. And probably, again, it may sound a surprise for you, but uh, federal mass media in Russia under strict state control. So I was not shown on Russian television for the last five years. Same actually applies to China. We'll talk more about this state. But Chinese leaders are even more restrictive by trying to control the internet. Putin uh, doesn't have the same uh, a grip on power in Russia because uh, one of the elements of, this, of keeping the balance in Russian society is to allow the young population to enjoy wonders of internet. So cutting the access to high-speed internet may lead to a revolution in Russia even without opposition. Uh, propaganda. Obviously, every century is posing different problems for us. And the problems we are facing in the 21st century, they are not the same as the problems we faced in the 20th century. Because today everything is connected. And uh, if we want to look for solutions, We must look at the big picture and not only separate pieces in the puzzle. So another piece of, uh, of also historical relevance. After World War II in 1946, actually in Mar March 5, 1946, in Fulton, Missouri, Winston Churchill gave a speech about the future, which is well known in the world as Iron Curtain speech. Yes, Churchill spoke about the new dangers for, to freedom, that time from communism. But it's also for, almost forgotten that he also, also warned about the newly formed United Nations, which could lead, as he described, to the gridlock and corruption. And, as usual, Churchill was right when he looked at the big thing because he could identify the real threat. And uh, before World War II, Churchill, who was a devoted anti-communist, insisted on siding with Stalin to stop Nazis' invasion. So what's, what do we have today? We're stuck with an outdated Cold War organization that was developed after World War II based on the results of that war, but also to prevent an, a nuclear clash between two superpowers. So the United Nations was built to prevent crisis, so to actually freeze it rather than to solve it. But with the collapse of Berlin Wall, the United Nations as this uh, freezing institution became obsolete. So, for instance, rising powers like India and Brazil, they are locked out of critical debates because the United Nations is still based, its Security Council, on the results of the war that ended 66 years ago. Now, 
Now we can also move to China. Recently it became a number two economy in the world, surpassing Japan. And of course everybody does business in China. I mean that's the like a buzzword, you know, you have to go to China. It's the fastest growth economy, okay, if you don't count Brazil, of course. But let's not forget, China is not a democracy. And Chinese people are still living under this um, uh, all-powerful uh, umbrella of um, Communist Party. So the people labor in the darkness of censorship without freedom of expression. So I have a theory that I'd like to share with you. A dictatorship can be temporarily successful implementing an existing agenda. And it could be a very efficient implementation because very often nations are struggling with certain problems that, can, that cannot be immediately resolved through democratic means. And there is an illusion that just, you know, having dictator uh, uh, an iron fist rule and things could, could work out. And it, sometimes it happens because there's an existing agenda. And implementing it, dictatorship can prove its worth of effort. But then, then what happens? Dictators, dictatorships cannot provide new agenda because new agenda in every society requires communication between the powers and the people. And there is no connection between the power in dictatorship and the people. So every dictatorship ends up with fighting for its own survival. And only modernization of the political life. And democratic recovery, resurrection, secures the normal development in, 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 in any country. So uh, now I would like to talk, as I mentioned, education and the development as innovation to uh, share with you some ideas from my new book. Um, the book that will be released uh, early 2012 it um, will be released in the United States and also in uh, eight other countries, including Brazil. I don't know the date of the publication, but hopefully it will be also early next year. The name of the book is The Blueprint. And those are two of my friends who are writing with me, Peter Thiel and Max Levchin. Uh, you may not probably recognize these names, but those two were inventors of PayPal and Peter Thiel was also an angel investor on Facebook. If you saw the movie Social Network, maybe you could have seen him. Um, now, the idea of this book may sound a little bit uh, of a as a paradox, or maybe too aggressive, confronting the conventional wisdom. Um, because we are looking at the current crisis global crisis, economic crisis, some call financial crisis. And we are arguing in the book, in these 280 pages, that the real roots of the crisis are resulted from the technological stagnation. So it may um, sound a bit odd, because we all have a lot of uh, gadgets in our pockets, and we believe that we are living in an era of the greatest technological advance. Actually, it's a, it's a false assumption, and I will hope I can show you throughout this little talk today. Uh, so um, if we look at the past, so, and probably we can analyze American history. Uh, so, the, the rapid growth of the United States was based very much on the culture of innovation. And uh, not only innovation, but an ability and willingness to take risk. So what do we have today if we just look at the corporate world and also 
we'll look at the demand of the main street, of the average consumer. So the top priority for business today is to reduce risk. So that's the top priority for business plan, so risk reduction. So how do we expect to get the same benefits by reducing the risk? Because that contradicts the whole nature of the credit. Credit was invented to be spent on something risky which could pro produce new values, higher values. If technology doesn't come up with something spectacular, something that is brand new, if it doesn't happen, then you have financial system, political system, economy producing something that will be a surrogate, this, a substitution, the substitution that will uh, uh, be a, a fake value. Um, one of the examples, so when the, I think that just people don't pay much attention to that, it's the um, aircraft manufacturing. Of course, we are playing in very comfortable planes today. They are more comfortable. There's a fuel efficiency. But we're still play, flying the same planes as 40 years ago. And they are the same planes. It doesn't create values. It creates fake values. And um, without these technological innovations and new initiatives, there is no cutting edge growth. And um, the challenge is, and again, I think that a lot of people still, you know, wondering, OK, what the hell is talking about? We have iPhones, iPads, Androids. Now, let's, but let's be, you know, let's be a visionary. Let's not be swamped by the conventional wisdom. Let's ask a question. What is a breakthrough technology introduced after Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak came up with Apple II in 1977? When I say a breakthrough technology, it means something that we use today that was invented after 1977. The answers I hear all the time, mobile phones. Wrong. The first mobile telephone call was registered in the United States in 1973. And I'm not even telling you that the original patent was, you could argue, in 1902 or 1962. Depends how you measure it, but long time ago. Now, the answer, of course, is internet. Wrong. The internet foundation was designed by American scientists working in so-called Advanced Research Project Agency. It's all these things, they had roughly 25 year cycle. I mean 25 years starting from the invention or inception of the idea to the mass production. And uh, do you think we have anything today that was invented in mid 80s? Let's look at the Time magazine, the list of the most um, valuable innovations. So Time magazine 2010, called iPad the Greatest Invention, 2010. Now, you look at Time magazine 2008, the best invention was iPhone. Tell me if iPad is not a bigger iPhone. Because what is happening is optimization. Optimization. It's convenient. Yes, I have no doubt. I mean, I use iPad. Don't just get me wrong. It's very convenient, but it's not revolutionary. And uh, let's look at the technologies used in the iPad. GPS. Invented in 1973. Flash memory chips, 1980. Digital photography, 1981. 
the first digital book reader, 1971. And even the first digital music player was already in the 70s. So let's think about internal combustion engine. And this is still the most important element of global economy. 1885, we're still living on something that was invented in the 19th century. And of course, you know, if we talk about uh, green technologies, about alternative energy, we're still facing the same problem of horizontal development. Because let's say somebody comes up with the solution of the alternative energy. But what are you going to do with all these airplanes? What are you going to do with tens of millions of workers that are part of this assembly line around the world? How are you going to start from the scratch? Because one thing that we should remember, new disruptive technologies, they're great, but they lead to more unemployment because first you will see you know, this, the, 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 the dip in the economy because the old should go. We had experienced some major breakthroughs during wars. Because at war, people can accept that they have to suffer. Even the Cold War was something that helped people to recognize the necessity of investing in, in something that didn't bring immediate profits. But now we're still living on these uh, treasures of the Cold War, of these great scientific ideas. So today, we'll look at the top tech, co tech companies, Apple, Intel, Cisco, Google, and look at the, their financial statements. They're sitting on tons of cash. Apple has about $70 billion in its bank account. Tell me, how come that the technology companies sitting on $70 billion and not investing in R&D? Because Apple's R&D investment is something like under 2%. There's something fundamentally wrong because they recognize that they don't know how to invest. Because today when you buy stock, high-tech company stock, you are basically betting against the innovation. Because the status quo, they want, that's what they want. They are afraid to lose the status quo. And uh, I think the energy should come actually from, from the outside of Europe and the United States, the countries that are relishing the status quo as the only way to keep up their leading uh, position. So we have to find inspiration to take more risk. Even you if you're on the edge, but it didn't stop. So, uh, and I can uh, throw a lot of other idea, uh, or other piece of information to show that things we use today, they have the foundation, scientific foundation, in 50s, 60s, or maybe early 70s. Actually, just to imagine what people could accomplish in those days, hard to believe, but the entire computing power of NASA, its US aerospace agency, at the time when Americans landed on the moon in 1969 was the size of one iPhone. You have it. This was entire computing power. How is possible, you ask me? And I interviewed people who were involved in the program just to find out. Because two, two things. One is they treasured every byte of the information. The software they created was unique. It's like a masterpiece. Today, with terabytes of information, we are too complacent and we can lose our satellites. They couldn't afford to lose a tiny piece of these kilobytes that they were available to them. And two, this is most important, they were not afraid to take risk. Some people even say that if Americans had the same computing power in 69, there would be no moon landing. Because any computer could tell you that the risk of losing the crew is probably 20%. I don't think any US president can authorize an operation with such a high risk of failure. But at that time, people were willing to take risk, and it did happen. 
And um, if you still don't believe me and you think that we are seeing tremendous progress, just let's look at the history timeline, the timeline of innovations. That's from 1860 to 1915. Just look what's happened. I also included genes. It's quite an important, by the way, innovation. Yeah. You have telephones. You have electric bulb. You have all sorts of moving devices, you know, from uh, cars, motorbikes, and planes. You have aspirin. And I can just, you can count, count, and count, and count. Submarines, movies, radio, from 1860 to 1915. It's all these things, they had roughly 25 year cycle. I mean 25 years starting from the invention or inception of the idea to the mass production. And uh, do you think we have anything today that was invented in mid 80s? L let's look at the Time Magazine, the list of the most um, valuable innovations. So Time Magazine 2010, called iPad the Greatest Invention, 2010. Now, you look at Time Magazine 2008, the best invention was iPhone. Tell me if iPad is not a bigger iPhone. Because what is happening is optimization. Optimization. It's convenient. Yes, I have no doubt. I mean, I use iPad. Don't just get me wrong. It's very convenient, but it's not revolutionary. And uh, let's look at the technologies used in the iPad. GPS, invented in 1973. Flash memory chips, 1980. Digital photography, 1981. The first digital book reader, 1971. And even the first digital music player was already in the 70s. Today, when you buy stock, high-tech company stock, you are basically betting against the innovation. Because the status quo, they want, that's what they want. They are afraid to lose the status quo. And uh, I think the energy should come actually from from the outside of Europe and the United States, the countries that are relishing the status quo as the only way to keep up their leading uh, position. So we have to find inspiration to take more risk. Even you, if you're on the edge, Russia is viewed by ruling regime as the as a corporation where you have to reduce your social overheads, like social expenses. Why do you waste money on education if your kids are already studying in Oxford? And uh, also a piece of statistics that over the last few years, Russia experienced the, the worst emigration wave since Bolsheviks' uh, revolution. And uh, to conclude, is I would like to just to start with this, my final um, pitch is with the words of great Brazilian author Paulo Coelho. So you have to take risks. That's a direct quote. We will only understand the miracle of life fully when we allow the unexpected to happen. And this is a more poetic version of what an American NASA, NASA engineer once said that if you know how much a project cost, it means your technology will be obsolete. If you want to know the result of this experiment in advance, it means you are not creating something new. Because in your mind, risk reduction is a dominating, dominating music. There is no safe path to success. Fortune favors the brave. Risk allows the unexpected benefits that you might not have even dreamed of. So I already spoke about the great explorers, Agaliaj, Cabral, and today the physical maps are complete. 
and the frontiers are known. So, but our goal must be to find new frontiers and to create something new to go beyond the known, to become the explorers. And this can mean innovating politically, technologically, socially, anything to inspire projects, pro progress. We need people who will think big and they will think big about the future. And then they will see a new generation of explorers. Because Colombo, Magalhães, and others, they had the confidence, the creativity, and let's be honest, the profit motive, to succeed where others failed. Leadership is not about the size of power. It's about vision, it's about determination, and it's about courage. And courage is the final and often overlooked ingredient of successful decision making and successful innovation. Leadership in the 21st century means doing what no one else is doing, going where no one else is going, and taking the big risks others are afraid to take. We have mapped the world, yes, mapped the world. You can have a Google map. But with courage and will, you can create new worlds, new worlds to explore. Thank you. Você acompanhou a segunda parte da conferência, Os Desafios da Democracia, com Gary Kasparov. Obrigado pela sua companhia e até o próximo Fronteiras do Pensamento.